Johannes Kepler studied the astronomical orbits of planetary bodies around their stars, and he was able to come up with three laws that govern the motion of the planets. The laws are fairly straightforward, and if you think about it in terms of our relationships of f of g, which is Newton's universal gravitation, which is the attraction to the masses, m1, m2, over r squared, and then the radial centripetal acceleration, m, a, c, sigma, f, sigma, <clears throat> f of c equals m, a, c, then the first law is the path of each planet around the sun is an orbit with the sun at one focus. And so here we see the sun at one focus, and then a second foci uh, out here generating the ellipse. So the orbiting planet would be somewhere out here, right? This is your planetary body orbiting around in an elliptical shape like this. Um, <clears throat> what we have to imagine is that since this body is attracted to the sun, according to Newton's gravitation, and then is following somewhat of a centripetal acceleration, right? It's not a perfect circle, although in reality the distances for the mass of the planetary body to the sun are actually very, very far, and the actual distance between the two foci are much, much smaller than I've scaled it here. If we shrink this, these two foci closer together here in the middle, the shape becomes more and more a circle. I've exaggerated the ellipse um, for demonstration purposes, but the reality is, is that looking into the sky, um, the planetary bodies were are near circular paths. However, they're not exactly circular paths, and Kepler was the one that figured this all out, right? And so, the path of each planet around the sun is an orbit with the sun at one focus. That's the first thing, right? And then the second thing is that each planet moves so that an imaginary line drawn from the sun to the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal periods of time. What this means is that due to the universal gravitation, this function, f, right, is changing based on the radial distance away, which means the centripetal acceleration is varied ever so slightly as the planet moves around this elliptical path. And so what's, I mean, what should be fairly intuitive is that the closer the planetary body is, the greater the force. This is because the radial distance from here to here, call this R1, is much less than when the pot, when the mass has rotated, orbited all the way around and is some location here, right? Remember that the sun is the main body doing the attraction, so R2 would be much further away out in this distance here. Now, what he meant by an equal area in equal periods of time was that as we get closer, the force that is doing the attraction is stronger, which means that the centripetal motion becomes faster. And so if we expand this to f of c sigma, there we did it right, is mv squared over r, the, the tangential velocity varies as the force varies, right? And so what that means is that generally this is moving much faster v here than it is here. So this would be V2 versus V1. Due to that fact, the orbit speeds up on the periods where the, sun, it is the, where the planet is closer to the sun, which means that during the same period, some time frame, this moves along a much larger radial circumference and maps out this entire area in that period of time, whatever that period of time is. Now you can arbitrarily set the period to be any amount, one day, one minute, one year, well, one year would be all the way around, but um, you know, one month, one, one week, etc. But the point is, is that if the period, the time frame from position one to position two is held at a constant, so in the same period of time, then when the planet orbits further away, as it gets further away, the radius increases. As the radius increases, the force decreases, right? The centripetal force decreases, and therefore the velocity decreases. So as this planetary object moves, 
it's actually speeding up on this side and slowing down on this side. So in the same period of time tracking along the perimeter, the, the planetary body may only move from position one to position two in the same period of time it took to go from position one to position two on this side, which means that if I map out this sector and I shade this area in, what we find is that the area here, area two, is equal to area one. Geometrically, this makes sense based on our fundamental understanding of sectors, right? And the fact that as we get closer to the sun, the force increases, the object accelerates more and moves faster with a tangential velocity, mapping out equal areas and equal time. Now, the revolution of this is that using these two formulas, the gravitational attraction and the centripetal force, Kepler was able to derive his third law. Right? The third law is that the ratio of the square of the periods is proportional to the cube of the radii. Written mathematically, this would be T1 over T2 squared is equal to R1 over R2 cubed. Now, what this means is this is a way of relating two orbiting planets. or satellites. So we compare one, one's object, one object's period to another object's period around the same central mass. Now there's a derivation in your book that goes through the exact math of using the force of attraction for one planetary body compared to another. But what you can imagine is that in our solar system, there are more than one planet, right? And so obviously if this was one planet, we could compare it to another planet that would either be orbiting with a smaller orbit or a farther out planet that would be orbiting with a larger orbit. In either case, the focus, the central foci are the same, right? The sun and some other point, arbitrary po or not arbitrary point, but some other focus point and the sun. The sun is the gravitational body that's creating the orbit, and so that's the thing you're comparing to. So you may compare Earth to Venus, or you may compare Earth to Pluto, right? In either case, the ratio of the period squared is comparable to the ratio of the radii cubed. Again, the as we saw before with intensity calculations, in a ratio calculation like this, as long as the units agree, in each category, then there's no need for conversions. And what's useful is that since our planet Earth orbits the sun, we can use what we know about Earth in terms of the time frame it takes for the Earth to orbit and the radial distance away from the Earth to compare to other planets, right? And this is exactly how planetary uh, radial distances were calculated for the other planets in our solar system. Let me just show you a simple example for Mars. This is an example from your book on Kepler's laws. It says Mars period was noted by Kepler to be 687 days, Earth days. Now it's important that we note that it's Earth days because obviously you, you could describe days differently depending on the planet. But in most cases, we'll be describing them strictly in Earth days. And so the question says, determine the distance of Mars from the Sun if the radius of the Earth to the Sun is 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters. And so it's a pretty straightforward calculation. What we're going to do is we're going to set up the formula of the ratio of the period of Mars compared to the period of Earth as a function squared equal to the radius of Mars compared to the radius of Earth. Now we're comparing Mars to the Sun and Earth to the Sun and so we're going to add that additional subscript and then this whole term is cubed. And so it, I find it useful to go ahead and just solve this uh, straight away um, for the radius of Mars compared to the Sun before we enter the numbers. And so if we go ahead and distribute the cube term onto uh, 
uh, each value and then solve for the radius of the mass, or excuse me, the radius of Mars compared to the Sun. What we will end up with is the radius of Mars compared to the Sun as being equal to the radius of Earth compared to the Sun times the quantity T m over T e to the two-thirds power. Now if you didn't see how I did that, go through the math of cubing each one of these, solving for r, m, s, and then taking the cube root, right? Don't forget that a fractional power is simply the root. And so then all I have to do is put in the values for each one of these, right? And so um, if the period of Mars is 687 days, then that will be the period of Mars. Now, I, I ask you to figure out what do you suppose the period of Earth is, right? If you're thinking, how long does it take Earth to go around the Sun? I would hope that your answer is one year. But of course, years and days are not in agreement in terms of units. So we need to be careful to convert. So the radius of Earth to the Sun was given in the problem as 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters. The period of Mars was 687 days. And then of course the Earth would be 365 days. Now depending on your significance, you may want to call this 365.25, but since this has three sig digs and this has three sig digs and this only has two, I think that's probably sufficient for your work. What you will, what you should calculate as an answer here should be about 2.28 times 10 to the 11th meters. This would be the radial distance of Mars to the Sun.